You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome everybody back to the Barbell Logic podcast. I am Nikki Sims and with me is CJ. Ahoy. And ahoy <laughs> to all you people on the land and on the sea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so welcome back. We're here to talk to you again today about the journey of becoming a coach and a specific part of it that um, even today still kind of comes up for me as an observation of um, kind of building yourself in the market is this question that I think people can run into that might stop them in their tracks of, are there already too many coaches out there and the fear that that might create? And we've been talking about that a bit recently, especially because, you know, especially if you listened to one of our recent podcasts, you know, we think online coaching is a pretty great way to go about coaching people, but it also makes you a competitor in a huge ass market. Like everybody who has the internet and says they're a coach is now someone who you're like competing for clients with. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And we've done some episodes before that kind of will help you identify your, your VIP and how to kind of make yourself stand out. But what I'd love to really accomplish today is to help you figure out how to get past that moment of, of fear that it, so that if coaching is really what you want to do and it's a career that you want to have, how can you allow your passion to turn into a career and still be successful in that huge market? Yeah. I think there and something we talked about in the VIP uh, kind of episode that we had, Nikki, uh, is sure, there's your VIP, there's your value, values, identities, and priorities. What about you? That doesn't necessarily, you know, there's not always going to be a one-to-one match between that and the people that you serve. It's like kind of bringing those together, bringing those circles into alignment. And the uh, what I hope we we pull from this is how to make that link between the two. Because the, there can always be that fear when all we see is the circle of the market. And we see uh, as soon as you Google the type of coach you want to be, you find the 5,000 other people doing the same thing. It's like, ah, so yeah. And they're all at different levels of, you know, success and experience and status. And so when you're imagining your career, or like, even if I were, even I still think about like, okay, how do I, how can I make myself stand out more online? Like, then I tend to start comparing myself to other people. And I think that's, that's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> so when you are trying to like, when you said speak to like combine the circles, like, what do you think is a good way to start making that happen? Well, the the first thing that comes to mind is where where are you as a coach, like physically in space, where are you coaching people? Uh, I think a lot of people who start in coaching, at least I think should almost, uh, is with their local network. We talked about this in, in VIP. We talk about this in our How Not to Totally Suck as a Coach article. If you're starting with friends and family, peers, coworkers, gym members, people like you in clubs near you and communities near you, then you are not in the same pool as Barbell Logic, as, you know, as uh, Matt Reynolds, as Mike Toucher, like the, all these people who exist in the online space, uh, they're not you. Like, so I think first is, first is getting out of where our attention is, where our spotlight is, which are on the people who we respect, and get down to our spotlight on where our people are. Because oftentimes that's in like a 10 to 20 minute circle around your gym. And that's a very different space. And you can kind of connect with them just by having a conversation and just being who you are right now. (laughs) Yeah, because they might have no idea that there is a person who is eager and capable of coaching them until you start to share that with them and invite them to your gym and have conversations with them. (laughs) You know, I I think... 
if you're not watching this on YouTube, like my face lit up there for a yeah, second. Totally. I'm sure that's what, that's what Nikki saw. Cause it reminds me actually, uh, I was having a conversation with a coach and, uh, this coach was like, how do I, how do I market myself? You know, how do I, how do I put myself out there as a coach? And I looked through, they wanted to start online, which that's a choice. And I looked through their social media profiles. I looked through, you know, uh, everything they had out there currently. And I had no idea. I would have had no idea they were a coach if they weren't a student. And so my first thought, like when when Nikki says, you know, like people, just the people in your immediate circle, uh, how do you share what you do? How do you know what you do? Part of it is also like you have to if if somebody that I know is into uh, I'm in California, so like uh, uh, they have a home brewery. I can't get them to stop talking about their home brewing practice, you know, or they're snowboarders or they're surfers or, or gosh, like they're, they're, they're CrossFitters. Heaven help. You know, they, they won't like the, how do you know if someone does CrossFit? They'll tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, how do you, how does someone know you're a coach? Right. Yeah. And if you don't tell them, I mean, you get the opportunity all the time to create the story that you want to be told. And so you can just let them know what you're up to. It doesn't mean you have to turn into a salesperson networker and be like, here's my card. Call me for a session. Like, I think if you just let them know that you're a resource, that's the first seed to be planted. <laughs> Agreed. There's so much, there's so much value in being that friend of mine who lifts. I know before before I did this professionally, how many people would shoot me, you know, questions through, you know, wherever or at work, you know, because I was I was a, a an officer at the time, a uh, support staff with the SEAL team, and my fellow support staff would be like, "Hey, I know you lift. Uh, like, I got a question. You know, I've got thoughts." Being that friend of mine who lifts, that people reach out to and ask questions, that's huge, and yeah, that's that's a start where nobody. Uh, I mean, to go back to competition, Matt Reynolds is not their friend. You know, uh, no, none of the Barbell Logic coaches are that friend of mine who lifts. So you already have a clear space to where it's not competition. It's you. I like that. So you could have conversations with them and then start sharing it on your social media. Is, do you think there are any specific strategies that work best when you start to share things online? When you're sharing online, it's, it's, I mean, there's like, are, are you going to, you know, content create and all that? Really, I think part of the issue is we get wrapped up in our heads. We have to come up with the answer. Like we, yeah. it has to be the definitive guide to the squat when we've been lifting for, you know, we're new coaches. So maybe we've been lifting for two or three years. Like, how am I going to compete with what all these different people are putting out there? And, uh, at first, I think it's more your personal story, more your excitement, more, you know, what it is that you're doing and that you're excited about and that your friends are doing. And like, there's, there's such a small gap between, hey, my workout partner, my training partner just hit a massive PR. This is awesome to my client just hit a massive PR. This is awesome. And that space, I feel like it's kind of natural to be in. It's natural to share our joy. And so I would say that's the first place to start is what are you doing? What's your story? What are you excited about? And what are the people you care about doing? I like that because it's like you even just pointed out, it can be overwhelming to think that you have to have it all figured out before you can start taking on clients. And I think that's a huge battle to fight with confidence is, you know, am I worth taking on clients? How can I, you know, ask them for money if I don't have, you know, a full 10,000 Instagram followers and my own websites, just like instantly overwhelming. <laughs> I can't even swipe up on my stories. How can I, <laughs> how can I coach? Yeah. <laughs> and I love this motto that you have of, and it's to just coach just coach someone and just talk about it because it's whatever you're doing right now is exactly the thing that you should be doing to help yourself go a little bit further. So one thing when we're when we're just getting started as coaches often we're looking at the coaches we respect like these are these are the people we admire and we start thinking uh I want to be a coach because I want to have the impact that they have and there's a, maybe a little bit of that you know that feeling like I want the respect that I feel for them uh 
so we have this idea that we have to be entrepreneurs, we have to be freelancer coaches, we have to run a gym or own a gym because that's what they do, right? That's what they did when we found out about them. We had to be content creators, something like that. Uh, do you even have to? One thing that one thing or I got started with most of my hands on coaching was working at a gym. So competition wasn't even really an issue. I was one of the coaches at a CrossFit gym. Sure, the gym was competing with other CrossFit gyms, but I could coach and just do what I was passionate about. Yeah, the that made me think the online environment, I think, is really tricky because you you have no constraints. You can coach whoever, wherever in the world. And that's a big deal. But like you said, being in the gym, you are coaching in that gym with the people who come to that gym. And I think it can be really helpful to create some, you know, artificial quote unquote constraints for yourself if you find yourself a little bit stuck of like, where should I go? I have to be everything for everybody, but you can't. <laughs> Just first off, you can't be that. So don't try to do that. <laughs> you have to be yourself, but to give yourself some movement forward, what can you, you know, limit yourself on just for now as like a thought exercise even to get going. Um, there's a cool story about Dr. Seuss. He like, I think when he wrote Cat in the Hat, it was from this competition from, or I, th I think it was based off of a study that like Life put out that kids, um, it had to do with literacy and kids just weren't reading because the books were boring. And so like, uh, I think it was a competition where they wanted authors to use it was like less than 300 words. They could only use those 300 words. They were the most important words for kids to pick up. And he ended up limit, like reducing that word count to 236. And that's how he wrote a book. He wrote a whole book <laughs> because he narrowed down the human vocabulary to just 236 words. And that was how he was able to kind of launch himself into this creative pathway. And like you said, just or not just, but to go to a gym and coach those people or to maybe speak to a specific audience that you're more familiar with. Like talk about what you know right now. It doesn't have to be everything, but talking about what you know is going to make you more authentic. And it's okay if that constraint exists right now, if that's what's going to help you kind of get over a, a little slump that you need to. <laughs> I love that. I, I think I'd I like to throw out a couple of, of thoughts on that as well, just as kind of a, a starter for people getting to like, but it's like, what, what does that mean? You know, kind of in practical terms, uh, when when I started, I am I made the commitment, I wasn't going to coach anyone I didn't know. Like if I didn't know you personally, and this was before I was even doing going professional, just if you're not a sailor or somebody at my gym or somebody like that, like I don't already know your situation, I'm, I'm not going to coach you uh, because then all of a sudden I need questionnaires. I need, you know, kind of a new plan. We're going to have to have a, a consultation session. And I didn't feel ready for that. Oh, that's cool. So like people that you know, people that uh, if you're, if there's a particular thing that you've been doing and successful at, uh, for instance, you have the gym record deadlift. Well, that's fantastic. So maybe work with power lifters, like work with power lifters in your local community, because that's something you know. I wonder if it was really um, reassuring when you were just like, okay, I'm only going to coach the people that I know. Like it probably, like, I wonder if it took you from... I can't get started coaching to you. Yep. I know exactly how I can get started coaching right now. Was anything like that happening? What was funny is it almost felt cowardly. Like oh. it almost felt like I was like, I should have been, because, you know, should, but yeah. I should have been more willing to put myself out there. And, you know, I have the CSCS at the time, you know, I like, uh, I, sh I should be willing to put myself out there as a coach. Uh, and I felt like this was me kind of retreating or backing off. But ironically, the next week after I made this decision and I was talking to people, I had just come back from a workshop, you know, where I was learning some of the lifts. I was just telling someone, you know, hey, you know, I did this workshop. I was so excited. You know, this is what I learned. They're like, could you show me? Within a week of deciding I'm going to work with the people and stopping, you know, trying to, to blast out all of these thoughts and content into different spaces and just sharing with people in my office in this particular case, I was helping someone with their squat. So on the one hand, it feels almost self-limiting, like, 
and I, I should do more. I should be more. I should be more flexible. I should be reaching out. I should be putting out more content, whatever that means. But it actually got me coaching where months of writing articles and doing such hadn't. Yeah, the content creation. When do you think that starts to become really important for coaches? If. Depending on the coach, never. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think for most, <laughs> I think for most coaches, it becomes important at some point. Uh, but how we define content is, I think, pretty, pretty iffy, pretty rough mm-hmm. to begin with. Uh, I think so. Coaches sharing their story and sharing the like a frequently asked questions to questions that their their clients send them or that their friends send them and that they want to answer. Or hey, I read this article. Here's my summary of it. If you're dealing with X problem, check it out. Uh, that's all content. And we never think about it as content because we imagine, like we look at the professional operations and we're like, oh, that's what content looks like. You know, someone like Thomas Frank and and his very professionally produced YouTube videos. Okay, you know, that's a level of content. That is a quality of content for a content creator. But I tell people to start, everything you should put out, assume, especially when you're a new coach, Assume that there's not an ROI. Assume that there's not something you're going to get back from it from like in terms of clients or something. So put it out because putting it out is good for you. It answers a client question and then you bookmark that so you can save it to people later. You build a reference library of like videos and demos that you send your clients or that you have to answer your own questions. Uh, it, uh, online logs, training logs logging your own experience through forums or social media platforms, which is just a convenient way to do it for yourself, also becomes a way to share, hey, I went through this experience back then, or here is when I tried this experiment. You know, let me know what you think. People get to see what you do. Uh, I think when it comes to, to a fear of competition, again, it's a fear of that, that imposterism and a fear of that comparing, you know, the, the comparing ourselves to the best out there in that space. You're not a content creator necessarily. You're a coach. So, so keep that in mind while you do this thing. And remember that you might only need 15, 20 people to get as many as you need. (laughs) And I mean, if you have, if you have 20 clients and they're even paying what, uh, 100, 150 a month, you're looking at 2000 to $3,000 a month for mo- for a lot of people. That is uh, maybe not, you know, their whole salary, but that's a really successful side hustle. I mean, that's enough if you're, if you're uh, working a full-time job that you don't like anymore and you're like, maybe I can shift to part-time hours. If you got 15 or 20 people who you are serving with frequently asked questions and ask me anything and, and developing that way and you keep them, you can shift to part-time. And they, one thing when it comes to this competition idea, there's too many coaches in the market. There's too, uh, the people who you're, the brain space you're competing for space for is those 15, 20 people. Yeah. And you already have a connection at, at in some way with them already through a friend of a friend or through what you're already doing with your training. Like they connected with you somehow because of something you're already doing. <laughs> So it's like a great reminder. Just keep keep doing what you're already doing. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that thought because that's an interesting thing. Let's say you have five clients, you know, that you met through the gym or through work or something like that, uh, and you're feeling like the, this pressure. I've got to put out content. I've got to put out. Con-. The first thing I would think is, how did your five clients find you? Ooh, yeah. It wasn't through content. It was because you struck up a conversation. It was because your friend who you helped get their deadlift to a certain point told their friend. And whatever that thing was that got you that five people, do more of that from the start so that you're not in this, you know, again, competing with everyone in the giant pipeline of Instagram and YouTube content. Like, what got you the first five? Do more of that. Yeah. And man, that can be such a great question to ask because you what you think it is might be something completely different. <laughs> oh, you mean asking your clients? Asking like, how, your did clients. You, how did you find me? How did you? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. You might have thought that it was one thing and they'll be like, no, it was actually because of, I don't know who, who I don't know, like something 
I don't even know. I can't even make it up because I have no idea. But it, you might have been operating thinking that it was this one thing and it's something completely different and you might just have a blind spot to some power that you have that you didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you know, I've I've got a, a story for that. There's So when I first started working in a CrossFit gym, I came in, I had my resume and I had my CSCS and my other certifications and, uh, you know, links to articles that I'd written from, you know, other, other providers. Because there's a difference between like being on somebody else's site where they had to, to verify you and then on your own blog. So like, I was like, oh, I published in Breaking Muscle, you know, I published on these different sites. Uh, and... They said, sure, we, you know, we'll take you on as an intern. And then within a month, I was working as a coach. And I was like, uh, that was a good resume. You know, like that content really helped. I had a con like a conversation with the owners of the gym uh, months later, maybe almost a year later, uh, about content and what they were trying to do at the gym. And they told me flat out, it's like, oh, no. We just like, A, we lost two coaches kind of all of a sudden due to life circumstances. So we needed one. They had three interns at the time and they took me on. They picked me to be the, the, the coach. And the reason why was because I showed up at, you know, they're required at 15 minutes early, stay 15 minutes afterwards, keep the gym clean, keep the records done, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like the clients reported good things and you never, you were never late. So <laughs> that's, that's why you made it. That's cool. And I was like, I was throwing my arms up there. Like, I thought all these things were so important. And no, it was making face. It was like providing the service and being professional and on time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Some things about that kind of business relationship have so little to do with the actual coaching part of it. <laughs> it's just being a professional. <laughs> Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> I loved you said um, on our notes, getting ready for the show, when it comes to like, creating content or writing something that thought loop of why would I write anything? Somebody's already written it. And yes, they have, because anybody can write anything they want on the Internet. <laughs> And you have 8 billion people, or however many have access to it, but a lot of people who are writing things every day. Yes. <laughs> who was it? It's probably Mark Twain. I think he said everything. But uh, that every story, uh, I, I just quote Mark Twain or Abraham Lincoln for everything, and I assume it's right. <laughs> uh, but that every story that's ever been told has already been told. You mm -hmm. know, we're just retelling them with different characters and different uh, flavors. And that's nothing new. Yeah, which is like kind of reassuring. Because whatever you come up with actually will be unique because probably no one's brain is like yours for good or bad. And so it's going to come out in a different flavor and it's going to hit someone's ear hole right at the time that it was meant to. And no one else has happened to get into it or show up in their on their phone or something. So it's like you can put it out there and chances are just going to align that you showed up for them. <laughs> So that's a that's a great one. Just the fact that the fact that something is out there doesn't mean that your 15, 20 people, your five people have made contact with it. I think part of the part of the the real advantage of putting out content in that sort of personal, intimate, you know, not like a content engine, but in that early coach way is you're the nerd about coaching. At least you're excited about it, you're interested, you're passionate about it, whatever. So you read articles, you know all these influencers that your people probably don't. Like they don't even know who these who these characters are. And so when you let's say you can curate their information, like you know, all the things you read 20 articles in a week Ooh. and you share your three favorite. Oh, you you're know, like a on, filter for them. Yeah. You are their filter. And so now when they when they see Dr. Oz posts, you know, some kind of like new ketone supplement, they bring it to you like, hey, you're the you're the guy. You have, you know, you have a, a good, you know, finger on the pulse of this thing. What do you think of this? You can you can curate, you can summarize for them. If you read a fantastic book about training, uh Ain't nobody got the time. I'm not going to hand somebody Brad Schoenfeld's text on hypertrophy and uh, when they ask me questions about it and they're like, uh, read this. <laughs> Here, I'm giving it to you for free. Hell no. Yeah, no. They need me to summarize something that is personal to them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and Brad said it and you know, he did the fantastic research and of course he gets all the credit and points to that. But your people need you to do that for them. That's great. Yeah, I love that. And that continues to build on your authority as the expert to them, which 
means they're going to they're probably going to start talking about you more, which would then expand the word of mouth option, increasing your market potential. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I like that. When someone goes to their, you know, when someone says, uh, or they tag me in an, in a conversation, you know, like there, I don't even know where they are on the internet. They're in some weird warren of their own fitness or personal world. And they tag me like, uh, hey, I've got a guy for this. You know, like, oh, hey, I know I know a guy who does this when it comes to rucking or something like that. Um, uh, here, CJ, could you answer this? I jump on those because that is, I can't imagine a better endorsement than a completely unscripted, off the top of the head, when someone is is struggling, their friend says, this is the guy who has your answer. And I, I don't expect to get a client out of those conversations, but I have. That's neat. What do you think about new coaches like offering free coaching sessions to anybody? Ooh. Yeah. So I think, I think, uh, I call it the resentment value of the of the exchange. There is free is fine on a dollar perspective if you're getting something out of it that matters to you and your boundaries are clear. So uh, I always encourage people to never give away for free, but it doesn't have to cost cash. You might you might ask for a review, like for your Google you know Google business page. You might ask for feedback at the end of your session. Uh, I know I haven't done this, but I know a friend of mine who asked people to donate not to them but to a charity. Like he picked five charities and say, uh, and like your ticket to this session is a twenty dollar or more greater donation to one of these five. Pick it, and then they print it out and they bring it to the session, which is kind of cool. Um, whatever, whatever it is, free is okay for learning and getting started, but it has to be meaningful enough that if this becomes a burden on your time, you don't resent the client for, or the person for taking this time from you. Mm -hmm. And we have such a hard time detangling. So imagine we're like, yeah, sure. I'll totally coach you. We'll meet up three times a week. I'll learn so much. Oof. Yeah. That can go too far. Three months into it, you're solving the same problems. They're making some steady progress, but things have started slowing down. You know, they're they're you're not really learning a lot because same client, same problems. Uh, and now you're spending three hours a week in the gym coaching them, and uh, things get pinched for time or pinched yeah. for cash, and all of a sudden you feel burdened by this obligation that you never set an end date to. You don't want to tell this nice person who's making progress, like, hey, you know, kick the can. But you also set at the start, like, we're going to do this for three months. And if you'd like to keep working with me, you know, then we'll we'll discuss then what would be an appropriate fee. That's cool. I like that you set a boundary pretty quickly, like three months, and then you get to reassess. It's just, it's an opportunity to reassess. And maybe after the three months, you'll want to keep doing it, but you also have the ability to talk about it again. That's yeah. Cool. I dig that. Um, you said something about speaking directly to um, niches. Niches? 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 <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. And I, think, I think Nietzsche, the philosopher, <laughs> Nietzsche, the yeah. philosopher, like I'm speaking to Nietzsche's, just a wall of Germans, you know, like <laughs> as far as the eye can see. That's a niche. <laughs> niche markets. <laughs> that is a niche market right there. <laughs> A niche of niches. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. So I think like a lot of the question that we get, there's a, there's a big vibe in the coaching space. Establish a niche, you know, uh, I'll just say niche from now on. Why not? Um, but establish a niche, like dial down or drill down to a small market. And this comes from the growth of the online space as uh, as the market is not People who want to lose weight, gain strength, be healthy for the rest of their life. Like, sure, if all you put on your profile is, I help people lose weight, gain strength, be healthy for the rest of their life, there's nothing to distinguish you. And if you're in the online space, you just blend, you just disappear into the fog. Um, And if you say, I do these things really well, everyone says they do these things really well. (laughs) 
So you get this, you know, kind of drilling down or people encourage you to drill down and niche, niche, niche. Uh, but you can end up in this really weird situation where new coaches who don't actually have the experience to bring a unique specific value to a specific submarket, so either a particular demographic or solving a particular problem, uh, end up flavoring their offering and their marketing for no good reason. It's like uh, those pink hammers that you see, like advertised as lady hammers or women's hammers. <laughs> uh, if you type in unnecessarily gendered products on Google, you'll find just waves of examples like scotch tape that's pink and it's, you know, girl's scotch tape. It's ridiculous. Uh, and we end up like looking like that as coaches because there's nothing substantive to differentiate us when we're a new coach, but we feel like we have to. So we throw the dark, uh, the darts. I'm going to coach uh, college age men, uh, you know, in business, you know, who are getting their MBA. Like they're, I'm niched down. What what do you have that's that's distinct to that group? So for brand new coaches, I kind of discourage that level of niching. Yeah. Uh, I encourage if you have like kind of a hook into a particular group that you're excited with, probably people like you. So if you're a nerd and you have, you know, you go to uh, Super Smash Brothers tournaments and tabletop gaming things, and you have like 50 to 150 people you meet at these different events, maybe that coincidentally becomes a niche for you. But I wouldn't force that at first. Yeah, yeah it seems like, it really seems like the theme is Go with what you are and who you are right now. <laughs> when you're new. Yeah. You know, when you're new and especially when you're in person, uh, because again, your competition isn't the internet. Your competition is what's, you know, around in your local space, uh, which is, that completely is the vibe. Anyone who wants a local coach, uh, therefore your your window is smaller, which for a brand new coach is awesome. Yeah. Now, if you've been coaching for a while and you're out there marketing yourself in the, the hairy world of Instagram and YouTube and all that kind of stuff, yeah, you probably do need a niche. Yeah. And by then you'll probably have your your mission statement and your, you know, three kind of core values that are your truths that you're going to kind of just hammer over and over and over again because that's who you want to be and that's who you want to connect with. It might be a little tougher to figure that in the beginning. No, I think that's, that's when I, I've talked to some, you know, experienced coaches and they're like, ah, oh, you know, how do I, how do I pick my niche? You know, how do I do this? Uh, I think that's an important question when it comes to like, there are too many coaches out there, you know, the market is saturated uh, because it, it it's often not as easy as it sounds because uh, we have to align. This is where those circles inter interlocking between our VIP and the market. It's like, okay, as I spent my first two or three years coaching, I learned a lot more about what I'm most capable at. I now have some experience working with people. Um, but then as I look out, I type in uh, what I was initially, which I spent more time powerlifting. There's a million powerlifting coaches, uh, like locally and online. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah, so like, probably a true oh, million. <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. like, oh no, my niche is full. Uh and so then we get into that, that we start that loop again. And I think it's important to walk in there and sort of figure out, wait a minute, mm, probably not. seems like there's a lot of room to be creative with how you deliver your service to, like, are you going to do it, you know, twice a week at an open class time in your garage? Are you going to do online and review workouts like, you know, twice a month? Is it going to be programming only? Is it going to be, you know, live online classes are you going to come to local gyms and figure it out? Like, it seems like that is a, is a way that you can distinguish yourself to including like how much you charge and how you do packages one session at a time. Like, do you take Bitcoin only? <laughs> like, that it seems like how you run your business is another way to distinguish yourself in the market. That's a great point. And I think it's, so this is a great point to, to which the, what classically looks like a niche, you know, a demographic and a problem, uh, there's a lot more to it. And how do you serve uh, can, can be a lot more than just the exercises that you do. So you pointed out how you deliver the program. I know uh, in the rucking space and in the sort of the mill fit space, there's a, like a military fitness and tactical fitness. Milfit. <laughs> 
Now there's a niche right there. Love it. <laughs> uh, when you're working with these groups, like right now, I know of several groups. There's there's Pathfinder, there's heavy heavy drop training, there's you know several different communities, and each one of them, like as, as having interacted with them and seen them, they're at different price points. They offer like uh, one is a lot more strength focused and has different options, and there's it's more intensive. It's also more expensive. Pathfinder is more. Uh, it's it's like they provide you essentially a template, a framework for you to complete within three months. And it's a group delivered program. Uh, and so the way these things are delivered aren't just, you know, well, I do two sessions and charge $70. I choose three sessions and charge $110. Uh, it, the, the differences in the delivery actually change who the product best serves. So the flexibility of a Pathfinder of this is how many miles you have to hit and challenges you have to hit in three months. You have an advisor to kind of help pick you, but you have almost ultimate flexibility. Go. That's a lot different than weekly programming or one-on-one -on -one programming. or And that's going to fit a different market of people, a different level of commitment, a different you know uh, life, life situation and work situation. So that difference in delivery is meaningful in meeting that market in a way that oftentimes we're like, uh, well, I guess I'll charge every two weeks. I'll charge bi-weekly instead of monthly. That's, that's a sure, you know, it's a trick to pull a little bit of extra income, but it doesn't meaningfully change things to the client. Create more friction than it really needs also. Could be. Excellent. Well, I think that something important that we've probably harped on and I find this really helpful from things that CJ has said and just things that I've read is whoever you are right now and what you're curious about right now is a great place to start. And you already know more, most likely, <laughs> than the people who you're trying to coach. So give yourself some credit, start talking, start connecting with them just through some conversation. But just know that wherever you right now are right now is great. And there's only one of you in the market and someone really wants to work with you. And hopefully that's enough to make you get started and keep you going. <laughs> By definition, you work with one person, you're a coach. Aww. If you if you protaskinate on writing articles and getting certifications and for uh, in any of these different things for years before you start coaching, you're not a coach. And I think that's that's part of it too. If you if you take it's not the easy route. It's actually the hard route because it takes the moment of stepping up and saying, wow, I'm going to coach my mom. Like I'm going to coach my friend. I'm and I'm actually in this thing now. It puts you on a whole different tier that is exciting. And it takes this market saturated conversation and sort of makes it irrelevant. Like yeah. you have, you have permission and you're serving today. I love it. Awesome. Thank you, CJ, for all that. Always such good gems from you. <laughs> and, uh, a, a niche of niches. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all so much for listening. I hope you got a gem yourself out of this. And if you enjoyed it, we'd really appreciate a review on whatever platform you listen to this on. It helps more people figure out that we exist and hopefully we can help them in their strength journey and so wherever you listen to give us a five star rating give us a review let us know what you think and happy training to you all happy coaching i love that if you if you work with one person you're already a coach Excited. heck yeah <laughs> take care thanks all thanks